Hi, it's Dre Griggs and welcome to day three of the Wealth and Retirement Challenge. I hope you've been enjoying this week. I know I have. We've already knocked out two of the days. So on Monday, we talked about how to create unlimited wealth. On Tuesday, we talked about gauging your retirement readiness. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we will talk about long-term investing. And long-term investing is very important. In fact, I don't know how you're gonna create generation wealth without your ability to have long-term investments. You cannot be someone who's going to focus on whatever the fad of the day is and expect your children to be able to repeat that. And there are many fads that we have, right? We had the metaverse, we have AI currently, we had the dot-com bubble, the real estate bubble from the last recession. There are so many bubbles, they happen every few years, that if you have a short-term approach, then it's, it's going to make sure that you run out of money. It's likely going to result in you running out of money. It's important when you talk about strategic retirement planning that you are building multiple income streams. In fact, I haven't mentioned it to you, or maybe I have, but did you know that 65% of self-made millionaires, according to the IRS, have at least three streams of income. At least three streams of income. Now, how many income streams would you say the average person has? Right, if you, if you guessed one, you are correct. The average person has one stream of income, their earned income. But there are actually seven streams of income that the IRS says that they recognize. And if you want to be able to achieve financial freedom, if you want to be able to create generational wealth, then the quickest or at least the most efficient way to do it is to build at least three streams of income. If I told you, hey, seven out of 10 people who have become self-made millionaires follow this process, are you interested in learning and following that process? I assume you're going to say yes. That's what I would say. I, I assume that we would say yes. And I'm telling you that seven out of 10, 65% of self-made millionaires have at least three streams of income. Now you said, well, Dre, what if I wanted four streams? I'd be like, hey, good for you. If you want four streams, about 45% of self-made millionaires have at least four streams of income. And those that have five or more streams, that number is about 29%. So I, I normally just say 30%. So about 30% of self-made millionaires have at least five or more streams of income. Now you see why it's so important that we get the three streams going. And as a result, when you teach your children this, then they will be able to say, this is how we make our money. These are the streams that we invest in. I would have you think of it like if you're watching Shark Tank and you know that certain sharks invest in certain opportunities. They have things that they understand, that they're excited about, and that they're able to contribute and add value to. And when they find those opportunities, they go and invest more money whenever those opportunities show up. So Damon Johns, you know, he always seems to invest in things that have to do with fashion because that's the empire that he built. Those are the relationships that he has and the connections that he has. This is no different than if you were to invest in the stock market and you said, okay, these are the certain sectors that I'm fascinated by, that I like reading about, and I'm okay learning and experiencing how this market works. Now, others of you would say, well, I'm, I'm a real estate agent or I've, I flip houses or I work in roofing or construction or something like that. So I'm actually more comfortable with real estate, which is also fine. And then others of you will say, the work that I do, I enjoy it and I'm a master at it. And because I have mastery of it, I think opening a business might be the best avenue for me. I can make money as a consultant or I can teach people, I can coach people, I can make a course, write a book, however you see it working. And I would say that's fine as well. So when it comes to the seven streams of income, and I'll put it on the board behind me so that you can see it as well, you have your earned income, which is the one that most of us have. You also have your profits. Profits come from a business. If you have any sort of business revenue, the profits is basically like my revenue minus my expenses. That's, that's my profits, right? Generally speaking. You also have your rental income from your real estate. Now, some people have rental income from equipment where they rent out cars or, or a soda machine or, or an ATM vending machine. There's a lot of different rental companies, but you rent your stuff out and that's your rental income. And you would get a certain amount of income every single month consistently as long as you have tenants or, or someone that signed the contract, however that works for you. So those high level is going to be the first three options that you have. Then the fourth one would be your capital gain. So that's you investing in the stock market. Whenever you leave your investments in the stock market for a year and a day, 
That is no longer considered regular income, but now it is seen as capital gains, which has a much more favorable tax rate. If you've ever heard like Warren Buffett and different ones, they'll talk about how they pay less in taxes than his secretary. Well, it's because hers is earned income and his is capital gains. So you would say, all right, so then Dre, if I took a step back, what levels does that then give me? Well, that gives you basically three levels. The levels are gonna be your real estate, it's gonna be your business, and it's gonna be the stock market. So that's where most of the income streams are gonna fall into one of those categories. If you're in real estate, then you probably just have rental income. If you have a business, you could have royalty income, which means that my company, we created something in some proprietary information or our brand where we license it out and we don't do any of the work, but we receive an income back for that. Disney licenses out different what products that they have where you may see Disney on, I don't know, like an ice cream pop, but Disney doesn't have an ice cream pop manufacturer. But Disney, <clears throat> sorry about that, but Disney doesn't actually have a ice cream pop manufacturing company. So that means that they just allowed someone else to use their image and that person paid them. And then you could have the same, I mean, Trump Hotels is the same idea. He doesn't build every hotel that has his name on it. Some of them he just makes money because he allows them to use his name on the front of the building. So you have these different options. You could write and do a variety of things, but that's your royalty and you can write books, make video games, you can have patents. All of these fall in the category of royalty income, but normally that, that's gonna fall under a business. So in a business, you have profits and your royalty income. And then the next category is generally gonna be the stock market. Inside the stock market, you have investment income, which we generally refer to as dividends. You have interest income, which could be long-term treasury bonds. It could be buying debt in other companies. The idea is think of it like your savings account. Interest income is gonna be one of the safer investments. So normally, if I give you $100 in my savings account, the bank is probably gonna give me $101. It's unlikely that I'm going to come back and find that my savings account has $90, right? I'm, just, I'm not really losing any money, but I'm, I'm not making a whole lot either. Does that make sense? And so you find when you're investing in interest income, they're gonna get an interest payment. You'll just get a payment every month or every quarter or every year, but that's it, it's just a set amount. If the company goes gangbusters and makes a ton of money, you're still gonna get that set amount that was agreed upon. If the company doesn't make any money, then you're still gonna get that set amount that was agreed upon. And so that one normally doesn't give much of a return and oftentimes it doesn't keep up with inflation, but we're in a good opportunity where it currently is. So if you're keeping track, then the first set that we have is your rental income. Then we talked about your profits, your royalty income. And then we talked about the capital gains in the stock market. And you have the capital gains, as I mentioned, a year and a day. And then we just talked about your investment income and your interest income. So the only thing that we have left is actually, I think I may have hit them all. So if I have investment income, interest income, royalty income, if I have my capital gains, my earned income, yeah, we hit all seven of them. I lost track of it that quickly. Most of us have a one income stream. We have our earned income and then maybe we invest that in a 401k, which means we have the opportunity to have two streams, but it's not really in our favor. They, while you forego paying taxes in the short term, there's no guarantee that that money will be taxed at a lower rate in the long term because historically taxes are at historical lows. So most people would say if, if you're already at historical lows, there's really only one place to go from historical lows. I mean, technically it could go lower, but if you're already at historical lows, then you, you may be putting yourself at risk. Also, when you talk about strategic retirement planning, while the 401k is a nice place for you to invest your money as you work towards a traditional retirement, when it comes to diversifying your income streams and then allowing yourself to be able to generate the amount of money that you would need to generate a wealthy retirement and then also a sustainable retirement, where when you stop working, the money keeps coming in. When you pass and your kids have it, they're able to fit right into the system and you just show them how the streams are. Just like on Shark Tank, you're like, this is the type of businesses we invest in. These are the type of stocks that we invest in. Uh, this is the type of opportunities that we're looking for. And then if you teach them the discipline, they're able to maintain and keep that going. And you already know, I've told you earlier, what is it that makes someone wealthy? And you may or may not remember, but I said, wealth is nothing but an indication of how much value you provide someone else. 
which is why I think a lot of people get caught in the scams of the short term. They forget that wealth is how much value you provide someone else. So if you were saying, okay, I'm speculating, I'm, I'm doing option trading, I'm making all this money, but how much value are you providing someone else? It can work, but it's also very difficult because you're, in my opinion, you're going against rule number one of generational wealth. Rule number one of generational wealth is that I am providing value to other people and that's how I make my wealth. So if you're doing something where I'll see like YouTube videos and they'll say, hey, make a ton of money making faceless, you know, automated videos or something like that. In my mind, that's not going to generate wealth because I know it's not providing enough value for other people. When you look on the Forbes wealthiest people, there's a couple things that you'll notice. One is they've been doing it for a pretty long time. It requires longevity. And then two, they're providing value for an immense amount of people, a humongous amount of people. So if you want to make millions of dollars and you have to invest in companies and in real estate and these opportunities that give the most value to the most people, you know, McDonald's is one of those companies that people often forget that they actually own most of the real estate that all of their businesses are on. They're like a real estate company. But they do put businesses on top of the real estate to then provide value to other people. When you look at Walmart, I saw a documentary talked about Walmart where they spend millions of dollars to find the perfect locations to build their Walmart. That's a very secretive process where there's maybe like five people that have any idea where the next Walmart is going to go. And because they spend so much money that you will find that other companies will say, you know what, Walmart puts so much effort into this. I'm just going to open up across the street from them. And if you notice, that's what some people do, right? You'll just see like a Target or someone just kind of open across the street. And, and I would too. If I knew that you spent so much time making sure that this was the perfect location, then I'll just go across the street and we'll, we'll work on this together. And you and I will notice that when it comes to most places, fast food places, they're pretty much across the street from each other. Whoever it is that spends the most money, understanding what brings the most value, other people are able to take advantage of that as well. And in my opinion, that's what we are doing as investors. There's someone who's already created the company and the idea. And then once we find that company, we just buy stocks and invest in them. We don't need to provide the value directly. Sometimes we can just provide value by giving the money to the business so they can grow. And as the business grows, they provide more value. And as they provide more value, then their growth happens. And then as they grow, the revenue that I get grows. My stocks appreciate. If they're paying a dividend, then I get more of a dividend. And so you have these different options. Now, when it comes to long-term investing, and I'm going to show you, so I will share my screen. It's very important for us to be able to recognize that there is some limitations in the way that we process information, right? The life that we have today is exactly based off the information that we currently have processed in our mind, the wisdom and the experiences and the awareness that we've been able to create. That means for us to be able to have different results we have to look at things differently. And that is why you'll see that I spent a pretty good amount of time talking to you guys about different false beliefs that we got to get rid of for you to be able to create these multiple streams of income so that you can actually achieve generational wealth and a wealthy strategic retirement for yourself. Now, one of the things I often hear is people say, Dre, investing is like gambling and, and I don't want to lose all my money. And ironically enough, there is a difference between investing and gambling, but there's even a difference between strategic gambling and just foolishly gambling. So if you go to a casino and you were to play at the slot machine, well, well, that's not going to work. The slot machine doesn't require any skill. It's all chance. And they designed the game for you to lose the majority of the time. And what that means is if you sat there all day, you will eventually lose all your money. Even if you got lucky and won a few times because of the way the game is designed, you will lose all of your money over the long term, which is where most people messed up with their investing. Sure, you may take a fad and, and you may be able to say, oh, I, Dre, I invested in NVIDIA and it went up like $500 over six months and I made a ton of money. That's great. But long term, if you invest in these fads and I'm going to show you later on, you're going to end up losing all of your money. But if you want to have long term investing, you have to have a systemized process to get the results that you want. And interesting enough, even though you lose all your money at the slot machine, you wouldn't necessarily lose all your money playing blackjack if you knew exactly how to play. 
And point in case, I don't know if you knew, there is actually a Blackjack Hall of Fame in Bar at the Baritone Casino in San Diego, California. Now, you and I might say, okay, well, there's lots of Hall of Fames. What's so special about this one? And I'm glad you asked. It says that the Baritona Casino awards each inductee a permanent lifetime comp for full room, food, and beverage. So, right, all the food you can eat, all the drinks you could drink, and all the nights that you could sleep there in exchange for what? Each member's agreement to never play at their tables again. Now, you just told me that you didn't want to invest because investing is like gambling, but there are people who actually gamble for a living. Correct me if I'm wrong. And they make a pretty nice living off of that. So all of these people, if you if you saw the right, uh, catch me if you can, or what was it? It was like, can you see me now? Or something like that. They made one. But the, the Four Horsemen in 2007, they went into the Hall of Fame to get their car players. But if you saw that movie, that was probably where they got that name from. But you can see on this, now look at these people. Ah, mathematicians. Okay. Professional athletes, sure. Professional players, people with the money to learn. Why not? Why not? They're all in here, in the Hall of Fame. And they get paid to not play. Because there is a systemized approach to get the results that you want. And investing is no different. If you have a process where these are the type of stocks I buy, this is the type of real estate I buy, these are the type of businesses that I create, this is my customer, my market, and my demographics, and you just follow your plan, sure, there's going to be ups and downs. But over the long term, you're going to do quite successful. Now, some of you will say, well, Dre, I'm okay. All I need to do is to be able to invest in one particular asset class. It's done me well. I buy all Apple stocks and I've been crushing it. Now, you could do that. I, in fact, I know some people that, that do that and they're doing just fine. Now, granted, they have had a great time. So there's a part of a little bit of luck in that because the market has been in a bull for the last like decade. So wherever you put your money at, you're kind of doing pretty good. And I'm gonna show you, so this is actually from NovelInvest.com and I love it because it actually shows all of the sectors. So it shows the 11 sectors, it tells you what the average annual return is for each sector. And then it tells you what the sector is. And then it tells you their best return. It tells you their worst return. Now, when we use words like volatility, what we mean is the spread between the best and the worst. So these are some very volatile sectors. So if you're just invested in one, then it's going to be pretty tough. Now, keep in mind when someone tells you, hey, if you invest in consumer discretionary, which just means when people have extra money to blow. All right, so discretionary could be like fancy trips, jewelry, new cars, things like that. That's generally considered discretionary. You're not going to spend your money on that unless it's your extra money. So if you have the extra money, you would have about an 11% return on average. In your best years, you have a 43% return. But your worst years, you're gonna lose 37%, right? Almost, almost, almost half of your portfolio investment, you're gonna lose on the worst year. Now, the worst years, you you and I will know, well, well, when won't people spend their discretionary? When they don't have it, well, when won't they have it? During a recession. So it's, it's if you're only investing in discretionaries, then that's gonna be tough during a recession. Staples is generally things that we gotta spend money on no matter what. So, you know, this, that's just how it is. I got to buy toilet paper no matter what. So maybe you could buy Procter & Gamble because they make toilet paper, stuff like that. And then real estate index, you can kind of go through everything. So the stock market itself averages about 8 to 10%. That's where it averages. Your best year, you make 32. On your worst year, you made 37 over this span. Now, what a lot of people do, so you can see here in 2008, we had the financial crisis. So, of course the financial markets got hit the worst. So if you're invested there, you'd have lost 55% of your portfolio. And you may have said, I, there's no way I'm going to invest in this sector ever again. I lost everything. And I'm tired of watching it go down, right? I've already lost 20%. So I'm going to sell everything before I lose it all. And maybe you waited till 30, 40%, who knows? But you sold it all. And then look, you can see the next year you would have gotten 17%. Now, for other ones, if you would have went the other way around, you could say, okay, well, construction did the best during the recession, which you're kind of like, wait a minute. Actually, I mean, that one's, that one, no, that was that right. That was consumer staples. Yeah, I was like, construction wouldn't have done the best in 2008. So consumer staples did the best. We're in a recession, just as I mentioned. People got to buy toilet paper. People got to buy soap. People got to buy water. There's just certain things that we have to buy. So, of course, when everybody's out of money and they can't spend on anything, well, they perform really well. Staples would in a recession. 
So if you were chasing returns, you would have said, okay, they were the best performing one. I'm going to put all my money in there. Well, in 2009, your best performing stock is the fourth from the bottom. And then you would have said, well, dang, I'm missing out on all these opportunities. So which one did the best? You said information technologies. Okay, I'm going to invest in information technologies then this year because everybody's getting a 62% return in information technology. But then what happened in 2010? Yeah, you guessed it. Information technology is one of the poorer performing stocks. So what you can see is you can't just go around chasing returns because the returns ebb and flow. And a lot of the times, if you see whichever one performs the best, more times than not, it ends up having a huge drop the following year because people were chasing the returns. They were buying the fad, the meme stock, where, oh, wow, you got a 20% return in utilities. I'm going to invest in there. And then they would have been the worst performing and got a 1% return when everyone in their mama in the market was doing fantastic. You can just see how difficult it is for you to chase the return. So you have to have a disciplined process, which I'm going to go over with you. If you're not gambling where you're just following fads, you're trying to time the market where you're like, well, this one's going up, so I'm going to invest in that one, but then it drops, you're going to find yourself either having a hard time sleeping because of how volatile it is, or you're going to lose all your money because you're going to end up saying, all right, well, now it's the worst performing. I'm losing everything that I had, so I have to sell. And it just doesn't work in your in your favor. And so you want to you want to be able to understand that. And we'll go into the homework where you'll be able to create the strategies. And it doesn't have to be as complicated as it could be. You know, for example, understanding why something performs well, right? 2008 is the recession. So I'm not surprised that consumer staples perform well. I'm not surprised that healthcare perform well. These are things that we have to do. I'm not su I'm not surprised that healthcare was doing better as we were starting to get into the, the COVID season and all that other stuff. And I think we had the, the swine flu was going on around, around this time at 11. So there's just different events that are going on. And if you understand the economic cycles, then you can take advantage of it. Now, when it comes to you doing long-term investing, where you're not trying to time the market, but you're also not scared and comfortable with it, I'm going to give you three nice choices for you. But first, I want to be able to knock out the other false belief, which is, Dre, you have to have money to make money in the stock market. Only the wealthy people invest in the stock market. While it is true that only the wealthy invest in the stock market, that I believe the top 1% of American money, the top 1% of Americans have about 50% of the stock market, right? That's the money that they put in. If you do the top 10%, then I believe that that lets you get to about the top, like 90% of the money in the stock market is from the top 10% of wealth in America. So like, let that sink in for a second. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be that way. So I do want to show you. So on this Excel, I want to get rid of that idea that you have to have a ton of money to make money in the stock market. The reality is you just have to have discipline and a little bit of time. But if you don't have the time, then you're able to overcome it. But let's go through it. So you may have seen this idea. So if someone was 20 years old and they want to do the traditional approach, which is I'm going to invest a little bit of my money and then I'll retire at you know 65 comfortably. Okay. If you want to have a million dollars at 65, then all you have to do is $5 a day, right? Let's just go on like a cup of coffee at Starbucks, which is just about $150 a month, which is about $1,800 a year, right? Could you invest $1,800 a year? And then you get the stock market return, which is about, like I said, about, we'll just shoot for like 10% on average. And you'll see that you'll have $1.4 million. And of that, 94% of that is not money you put in. So the principal column is the percentage of this money that you actually put in. So total, your total contribution was $81,000. And the money grew to $1.3 million. So that gave you the $1.36 million. Now, if you were to say, all right, Dre, well, that's kind of a long time. So how about we put a 20-year plan together? And I'll say, okay, that's no problem. So in a 20-year plan, if you gave $50 a day, about $1,400 a month. So you may say, well, Dre, my current situation, I don't really have $1,400 a month. But once you get rid of certain bills, once your kids grow up and they move out, or if you're early on in your career, then this is a great opportunity for you to be able to invest more in your financial freedom and to create your wealthy retirement. But if you put $1,400 in each month, 
That's about $16,800 a year. It's about $17,000 a year. In total, over 20 years, you'll have put in $336,000. And you would have, it would have given you or grown or contributed back, giving you the return of $667,000. And you still hit the million dollars. 33% of the money is your principal, but still 67% is money that grew in the market from you providing value to other people by leaving yourself in the market with time. Now, for some, they'll say, look, Dre, I'm older. My kids are gone. I got to catch up, right? So I'm 50 years old. I'm trying to get out of Dodge. Or if you're younger and you say, Dre, I just want to be able to hit my million dollars. I want to be able to retire. You know, I'm 20. I'm retired at 30. My, my clients generally, they're, on average, we're closer to probably like 35 to 50. So like that that range. So like, you're, you're, you're probably a, a young generation X or an older millennial. That's just generally who's at a point where they're like, yeah, Dre, I think I want to be able to figure out how to get my money to work so I can stop working. That's just how it's worked out. But so if you have 10 years, $5,000 a month, at $60,000 a year, that's definitely doable once you have a plan in place. So what I mean is we may have to put a five-year plan together to free up $5,000 a month and then we invest the $5,000 a month, right? That's definitely doable. We also could start smaller. Now, some people, will they'll scale up where we just start at the $5 a day. And then as things open up, as your money grows, then we can increase the amount. And if you invest in some of the other revenue streams, then that can contribute more. In my mind, getting to $5,000 a month is only difficult if you require yourself to only have one stream of income. But if you have multiple streams of income, as we talked about getting to three, you can see how that's not really asking a lot. If you have three streams of income, could getting to $5,000 between a business, a earned income in real estate or dividends in the stock market, a business and real estate, like, is that really a lot? Like just, you know, take a step back and think about it. And I would say no. If you have the ability to create the multiple streams, then it's much more doable and it's much, it's much easier for you to achieve. So that's $60,000 a year. That's a total of $600,000 that you contributed. And then you've already have 400,000. Now you'll see it flipped where you put in 60% and then 40% is what grew from your investment. But with that said, if you're creating generational wealth, then what happens if you keep contributing in that for not the 10 years, even though you could retire at the 10 years and you're comfortable, you're enjoying yourself. But what if you're able to contribute that amount for 20 or 30 or 40 years? Now we're talking about multiple millions of dollars that you have invested. And then what are you able to do with that money? You could say, all right, I'm going to go buy an apartment complex. So I'm going to level up. I don't need to have single family homes. I'm going to have an apartment complex. But it starts with you being able to get your money to work so that you can use that and flip it into your other opportunities. Now, you'll notice that I don't even go lower than five years. Now, it is possible if you already have some pieces in place, but I'm not someone that's telling you that we're going to have this done in one year. I'm not someone that's going to lie to you and tell you all the, the, the things that you want to hear because I'm not selling hope. I'm selling a plan. And if you have the plan, it's going to work if you work the plan. Jane Rome is famous for saying, he, he said, look, if you want to be healthy, get a health plan. He said, if you want to be wealthy, get a wealth plan. If you want, if you want to be in love, get a love plan, right? Like if, you, if, if there's a result that you want, you just got to put a plan together to achieve that and then follow the plan in a disciplined manner. And if you don't trust yourself to follow it in a disciplined manner, then you're going to need to hire a professional who can hold your feet to the fire, right? It's not that we all need to hire a personal trainer because most of us know what we need to do, but oftentimes to get the results, we hire the trainer. And I find that that's very beneficial. It's not that we don't understand something, but it's the awareness, right? Like the experience that I have, the things that I've helped my clients do, it's things that I would never have just known on my own. I wouldn't have had that much experience, but because I interact with so many people with different levels of experience and different goals and different places in their life, not only from the, the training and the education, but just from the practical real life experiences, as a result, I have so many ideas for my clients where I can help them, where there's clients where it was like, okay, my kid's going to college. I didn't really save as much money as I wanted to, but I, I have this amount. And then we would put a plan together where they bought a, a townhome 
And then the the kid had like rented out the other two rooms to their friends, which is pretty normal. And then they sold the townhome when the kid graduated in four years. It had appreciated. It was a pretty good market. So not only did they have the rental income while the kid was in college to help the kid to, to pay for the books and the tuition and everything, they also had the money to when they sold the townhome and the kid was able to like buy their first house or they were able to give them like a wedding present where it's like, all right, hey, we can help pay for the wedding, where we're able to work the money in a way over a five-year span where it was very beneficial for them, even though they didn't have all of the money that they needed. And for some of us, that's exactly where we're at. We don't have all of the money that we need for a traditional retirement where I have, you know, several million dollars invested through my 401k and I'm going to live off of 4% every single year. But if you were able to take that money out and then flip it into a, a rental opportunity, well, then you don't need as much money. Or if you were able to start a business with some of that money or buy a business, right? I had just seen a retired person. She had bought a an ice cream shop. I think the ice cream shop probably sold for like $50,000 and I think it cash flowed something something like $30,000 and she's got like one or two employees, but she's able to turn $50,000 into a recurring income now. And whether she opens up eventually another you know location for that business or she ends up selling it and she's grown it so now it's just worth more and so she flips that money in a certain amount of years you just really have to think strategically about your retirement it's not just putting the money in your 401k and forgetting it and i can't touch it until 59 and a half what if you retired at 40 well and then all your money is in your 401k with a penalty but if you have your money in these other revenue streams then it can definitely work in your best interest and that is, that's going to be, I think that's it for us today. I, I was about to say that, but actually, let me just check real quick. So the other thing, ah, you, you wouldn't have let me go. You wouldn't have let me go. But I did owe you three long-term strategies, and I'm going to give them to you. I was thinking about saving it for the inside of the group of the Wealth and Retirement Challenge, which again, if you're not a part of the challenge, I don't know what you're doing. But if you go to obsidianwisdom.com forward slash retirement challenge, you can sign up and then it'll suit you a link to join the private Facebook group. And in there, as you go through this challenge, I'm in there I'm helping you, I'm answering your questions. I'm doing anything that I can for you. Just, just join the, the challenge as well. If you find value, obviously like the video. All right, so this one is called the permanent portfolio. And the permanent portfolio is very simple. The idea is I'm gonna invest in certain certain asset classes at all times. So there's just four of them, but each of them performs well in a different type of economy. So in a time of economic growth, the stocks go up, businesses do well. In a time of recession, stocks normally go down. So I put my money in cash you have inflation. Well, if my money's worth less and I want gold and then deflation, which is sort of where we're trying to get to, you'll see long-term treasuries. Why? Because as the interest rates go up, as they try to control the inflation and create the deflationary environment, they're pulling money out of the market. And as money pulls out of the market, everything becomes more expensive, very hard for businesses to, to function. And it's very hard for people to buy stuff. So you end up just saying, all right, well, if the government's going to pay me five or 6% just to take my money out of the market so that we can create a deflationary environment, you might as well take advantage of the, of the no risk return or low risk because sometimes our politicians suck. So you have that, you have that option. So that's what that would look like. That is the permanent. Now this one doesn't have the best returns, but it has a more consistent return. There's less volatility because look, you're always gonna have something that performs well in the market and then you always have something that's kind of lagging. But so this is a very safe one. If you're someone who wants to make sure that you gain a little bit more, and maybe you read the, the book, the I think it was called the, the Master, the Money Mastery or Master of the Game. It was a Tony Robbins book. And he Ray Dalio had given him the, all season portfolio, which is kind of the same idea. I have my portfolios allocated in a way where my investments, where I have something performing well in each economic environment, whether it's inflation or deflation, whether it's economic growth or economic decline. And so you have 30% in the stock market, you have 40% in long-term bonds, 15% in intermediate bonds, 7.5% in commodities, 7.5% in gold. So you see you only have 30% in the stock market and then you have 55% in bonds. So that's that's really safe. But you also have gold and commodities. Your commodities, you, I've seen some people use traditional commodities like silver. So I've seen some people put real estate in place of that, but you have that option. 
The golden butterfly is another one where it, you have your money in different sector, sectors so that you can perform well during certain economic times. But at the same time, this one normally outperforms the other two because you have more money invested in the stocks. So you have 20% in the stock market, so you're the traditional version. And, and some people will say, all right, well, I want to break that with 10% in large caps and 10% in emerging markets, which is totally fine. You can you can splitter it how you like. But you have 20% in the total market. You have 20% in small caps, so that's more of a growth strategy, a little bit more volatile. So normally if you have a longer term, you're doing good with that. And then you have 20% in long-term bonds, 20% in short-term bond, and 20% in gold. So you have the last 20% in gold. And so you'll see that, again, same idea. I have something that's performing well in each economic climate. I'm hedging a little bit, but this one, you're, you're sort of leaning on it being a really good time for economic growth. You still have 40% in the stock market. You have 20% in gold to protect yourself a little bit. And then you also have a little bit of protection with the long-term bonds. And so you have that. And then this one's actually from Entrepreneur Magazine. I got it from CNBC, but I figured you guys are probably tired of of me referencing some CNBC, so that's why I use this one. But they got it from them too. So 65% of millionaires have three streams of income, 45% have four streams, and then 29% have five or more, just as I had mentioned. And so if you want to be able to create a million dollars, again, as I've told you, it's not about having the money, whatever the money is, cool, why not? Money comes, money goes, but the idea is, can I teach this to my kids? Can I create something sustainable in the long term? Can I provide immense value for other people? And can I level myself up? And I really focus hard on that fourth one where we're leveling ourselves up because we don't want to have a bunch of money and then we lose it all, i.e. the people who win the lottery because they never leveled up. The, the biggest benefit of being a millionaire is not the money. It's who you had to become to get that money. And so that's that will do it for us today. Your homework assignment today is for you to create your asset allocation. However you want to do it, decide what three streams of income you're going to focus on, dive all into. And if I could, because I spend a lot more time reading about the stock market, so that's normally where my comfort is. But I like the stock market for a couple of reasons. One is it has a lot uh, lower of a barrier to entry than real estate, right? Real estate, you normally have to have 20% down if it's like your second home. You don't you don't normally get that that. A HSA option where it's like three or five percent. So you have that 20% down, that's a much higher barrier of entry. But in the stock market, you can start with five dollars. And then in the stock market, you also have the ability to access through REITs, real estate investment trust, real estate, where you buy companies that buy real estate, and then as they make money, they give it to you. So now you're a silent partner in a real estate fund. You can also invest in some of these amazing companies. So it's like you're a silent partner in businesses. And then you can invest in dividends, so you're getting the investment income, you can invest in treasury bonds and get the the interest income so you have the ability to access so many uh, streams of income that that's why i like it now it may not work for you because there is some volatility as we talked about where there's ebbing and flowing and you have to have the stomach and a disciplined strategy for that but as far as getting started like if it were me i would get started in the stock market and then when i hit a certain amount about five years is what the plan would be i would then look at where the next place that i can make the money and then if you're interested in figuring out when the right time to sell is, I do have some videos on my YouTube channel that I'll link for you. But if not, you can go into the private Facebook group at obsidianwisdom.com forward slash retirement challenge and you can ask the question and I'll answer it for you.